Good afternoon and good morning to our West Coast listeners. My name is Juan Thomas, Chair of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Section. And today I'm so honored to have as our special guest, the CEO of the American Jewish Committee, former Congressman from the great state of Florida, Ted Deutsch. Ted, welcome. Uh, thanks, Juan. Great to be with you. Glad to have you. And congratulations on your new role as CEO of AJC. I believe you started there last October of 22, correct? I did. Thanks. And I should say, as a, a former member of the section back when I was practicing law, it's especially exciting for me to join you today. Well, glad to know that. I'm not sure we knew that, but I'm glad to hear that. We'd love to have you back now. And um, we appreciate all the work that you're doing um, in your new role. I want to kick off by asking you that you recently held your annual global forum event, um, known as the premier global Jewish advocacy event of the year. Could you share with us some of the big takeaways from that event and any type of impactful conversations you had during that week in Tel Aviv that you'd like to share with us at this time? Uh, sure, thanks. We um, did just have our global forum. It was in Tel Aviv this year to coincide with Israel's 75th uh, anniversary. And there is something really powerful about having uh, 1,600 uh, of our uh, leaders from around the world come together uh, in Tel Aviv. We had s over 65 countries represented. And uh, AJC's mission is to enhance the well being of the Jewish people in Israel and advance democratic values. And both of them, I, I think, were really important. Uh, th those missions were very important right at this moment. We were in Israel, where uh, you can see de democracy on full display, uh, whether it's what's happening in government or the hundreds of thousands of people protesting every week. Uh, that, so the, the discussions about democratic values that took place on our stage with the range of views from the government officials to the opposition leaders to meetings we had with protest leaders, uh, really, again, a reaffirmation of the importance of democracy. And, uh, and then we had, again, these meetings with, uh, with people from, from all, literally every part of the world. And there are a whole host of issues that matter greatly to the Jewish community, no matter where uh, we live, but that also matter at a time when in many parts of the world, uh, democracy is challenged and to be able to engage in those kinds of really meaningful conversations uh, together in one place was, uh, was very impactful. And I think we'll spill over into the work that we do uh, in the year ahead. And where's your conference next year? Uh, next year, it's gonna be back in Washington, DC. Okay. Uh, next, <laughs> next, no, next June, and we expect um, uh, another big crowd. And uh, of course, it'll be an election year in the United right. States, so there'll be a whole host of issues for us to tackle there. And um, we're we're our, we just uh, just wrapped up in Israel, and we've already started planning next year's global forum. Well, speaking of Washington and your prior work as a member of Congress, where you served on the Foreign Relations Committee, you're also on the Judiciary. Chair, chair, of the ethics, chair of the Ethics Committee, you bring us a, um, a great deal of policy expertise to the, your new role. Um, how do you see your policy background um, in developing the work of AJ, uh, AJC um, in, in, in this new era under your leadership? Uh, well, I, um, I, I spent, I spent um, many years in politics. I was in the state Senate for a few before going to Congress. And there are a few things that are important from that work that I bring to this job. Some of them policy-based. I, as you point out, I, uh, I was involved in foreign policy. I chaired the Middle East North Africa Counterterrorism Subcommittee. So everything having to do with the Middle East came through our committee. I traveled extensively to the region, meeting with Israeli leaders and Palestinian leaders and leaders from all throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and that, that's relevant as we engage in the diplomatic work that AJC does. Right. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to enhance opportunities under the Abraham Accords, what it means not just for 
for Israel and for the UAE, United Arab Emirates and, and Bahrain and Morocco uh, and the US to be involved, but really the opportunities that it presents for the region and the world and what it can mean to expand. So the policy piece matters a lot, but there's also the fact that I served in politics for a long time and I know, I, I can say I know how my former colleagues in Congress think. And, and as we go about our advocacy, I think it, I'm looking forward once my one year period is up and I'm able to really engage with my former colleagues again, I'm looking forward to, to playing that advocacy role on behalf of AJC and, and the Jewish community and, and the issues that, that we care so deeply about. We all look forward to your one year uh, probationary period being over. Uh, I guess this coming October. Let's yeah. pivot now to focus on um, anti-Semitism. Um, that, there's been a rise in um, anti-Semitic rhetoric lately over the last several years. I think you and I both um, have seen that. Um, we know um, there have been, unfortunately, people in high public office that have kind of opened the door to that type of um, rhetoric. Um, thankfully, the Biden-Harris administration recently revealed the U.S. national st strategy to counter anti-Semitism, which AJC played a significant role in producing. Um, you also have called for call, done a call to action regarding this work. Um, what encourages you about this development, and how do you see a the whole of government approach, um, particularly um, working in that in that to to, to combat anti-Semitism? Uh, yeah, it's a really, I appreciate the question, Juan. It, I think we, the most significant part of, <laughs> excuse me, of the strategy that the White House has presented is, uh, is the acknowledgement that anti-Semitism, at, at a time of, of rising anti-Semitism and threats to the Jewish community, it's the realization that anti-Semitism never just affects the Jewish community. It never stops with the Jews. And, and recent history makes that clear that uh, I was involved when I was in Congress. I did a lot of work on, on gun violence prevention uh, from the time I got to Congress. But after the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in my district, it became intensely personal for me. And we've con I've continued uh, to pay, obviously, as we all have close attention to that tragedy of gun violence around the country. The shooter who went into that supermarket in Tops looking to kill black Americans when was an avowed and proud anti-Semite. He wanted everyone to know that. The shooter who went to, drove all those hours to El Paso mm -hmm. looking for members of the Latino community uh, to gun down, also wanted people to know how much he despised uh, Jews and the Jewish community. And it was, it was what he saw in his his forays into the dark corners of the internet that uh, that really sparked that. So this plan recognizes that we're all in this together, and it has a hundred more than a hundred actions that the federal government can take from the Department of Education and and the Justice Department and State Department to the Small Business Administration, where just this week AJC and and the Small Business Administration signed a, a memorandum. Uh, where we're going to provide assistance to them in, in the work that they can do to help combat anti-Semitism. It's a really thoughtful approach across the whole of government. But then just as and consistent with AJC's approach to a society-wide uh, way to tackle anti-Semitism, the, the Biden plan, the White House plan, also has more than 100 action items for the business community and education and nonprofits uh, state and local government, Congress, and our the way we view our role here, having having contributed to the creation of this plan, is to have someone in AJC identified identifying with every one every one of the action items, so that we can be sure that this actually carries through. This was a great it's a great document, an important document, but. Uh, in order for us to make sure it's effective, it's going to require diligence. And this is the last thing, one, if I may, one of the most important things that AJC does is, is acknowledge that if we're all in this together, that means we've got to work together. And so our inner group work and our inner religious work, uh, whether it's our Muslim Jewish Advisory Council 
or the work we do in Latino Jewish relations and, and our, our Black Jewish efforts and, and our work with the Catholic Church, all of that uh, contributes to the, the kind of um, approach that's necessary to fight hatred of all kinds. And this plan will give us the opportunity to do that. I'm glad you mentioned the um, interconnected work you're doing. I kind of wanted to kind of follow up on that when you referenced yeah. what's going on in other communities. What ways um, are you particularly focusing on developing those allied relationships? How, how can we better work together um, vulnerable communities, communities that have been historically oppressed? You know, I know in my work and reflection and reading of the civil rights movement, you know, you, you hear of how the Jewish community played a significant role in helping, you know, Dr. King and others um, back in the 50s and 60s. How do we strengthen those bonds and what work are you doing to um, develop those relationships? Uh, yeah, when I when I was in Congress, uh, Juan, I spent a lot of time with with my colleagues focused on on these issues and and trying to look for ways to lift up uh, everyone in America. I, right. John Lewis, John Lewis was was a good friend. He was also a hero, not just of mine, of so many of us. And, oh, my and, we, yeah. and, and I can't, I can't believe that I had the privilege to serve in the U.S. Congress with him. And we spent a lot of time talking about what it takes to build coalitions that can create change. And it starts with, with knowing one another and working with one another. Um, he, that was his life. Alcee Hastings, uh, the late Alcee Hastings, my dear friend from Florida, my neighbor down here, uh, had a program every year that he did in Congress, bringing together uh, young Black kids and young Jewish kids. It was a, a really powerful way. And so now in this new world that I have, uh, even this week, AJC is uh, relaunching the Black Jewish Caucus in Congress mm. so that we can use that as an example. There is a a Latino Jewish caucus that AJC also helped to launch in Congress. And, uh, and the work that we do, the partnerships that we have with both groups in the Black community and in the Latino community, uh, we had a big summit on Latino Jewish relations in Washington a couple of months ago that I was privileged to participate in. It starts by recognizing the things that we have in common and, and acknowledging that we can't only look to one another when there's an emergency. We have to be doing the work uh, and, and making sure that we're, we're working with each other on the things that really resonate in each community. That's a, a big part of this. And that's how we approach the, the intergroup work that we do. We just can't respond to crisis, right? Well, it's not, yeah. it, it, it's not reasonable to think that, um, that if, if I'm not paying attention, if I'm not paying attention to my neighbor and then something happens to me and I'm gonna to go to my neighbor and say, now's, now's the time for you to come help me. Right. Uh, we, need, we need to have the relationships and deepen the relationships and, and be there for one another. And, and there are things that, look, I, I'm focused on, on the Jewish community and fighting anti-Semitism. And I want to have allies. That's going to mean that I'm working with my friends in the Black community and right. the Latino community and the Asian American community on things that really matter to them. So that again, we're not just there during times of crises, but we're there uh, at all times with the relationships that we can build upon. That reminds me, um, back in April of this year, your former colleague Al Green of Texas yeah. invited me along with our staff director for our section, Paula Shapiro, to the National Remembrance Day on Capitol Hill of, of the Holocaust. And there was a phrase that I remember hearing that morning, justice, justice, you shall pursue. It comes from a, a Hebrew um, phrase, Zidik, Zidik, turn off, am I saying that right? That right? ecstatic tear dove, but that was pretty good, Juan. Okay, pretty good. close. Yeah. It reminds me of what I hear often in my faith tradition, also from the Old Testament, uh, what does the Lord require to seek justice, right? Yeah. Mercy, walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly, yeah, that's that's our tradition too, of course. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mentioned those two phrases because I wanna ask you, how do we as 
not just through policy, which is critically important in law, but how do we as individuals combat anti-Semitic rhetoric? What should we be doing on an individual, personal basis? Just yeah. To... Yeah. Here, here's the, I appreciate that question so much. For, for those of us who are really committed to, to fighting hatred and bigotry, um, there was, after the killing of George Floyd, uh, and in the midst of, of the, the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, there was a realization that it's really important for everybody to be focused on fighting racism uh, and, and, and most importantly, having zero tolerance for racism and being willing to speak out and that there's no racist joke that's ever funny. And if someone thinks it is, they should be called out. And there's no racist characterization of a, of a person that, that should somehow be acceptable in any way. Well. It, that's the way that we fight anti-Semitism also, that there's no Jewish joke that's ever funny there's no, at the expense of someone in the community, that there's no, there's no conspiracy theory about, uh, about the Jews or Jewish power, the, the kinds of things that we talk about in our document that AJC put out called Translate Hate, the anti-Semitic tropes about Jews and money, things that sometimes people don't even know what the origin is that we've been dealing with for, for, for millennia, um, that, that anytime you hear it, you push back. And that's what we can do. We, we could never accept the normalization of racism. It's something that we've been fighting against as a country. And, um, and you can't accept the normalization of, of anti-Semitism or anything else, but it starts with, with being able and willing and strong enough to stand up to someone and say, no, 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 that's just, it's not funny. And maybe you should learn a little more. And let me give you this, let me give you this thing that AJC put out that helps explain this a little bit better. Um, that's the kind of thing we can do. Well, that's a great segue to my next question. What are some resources you would recommend either from AJC or other um, organizations that can educate uh, not only lawyers, but the broader community about how to combat um, hatred, anti-Semitic rhetoric um, in our daily lives, but also um, in our own, you know, circles of influence? Um, well, I, I do there, AJ, if I, since you asked, and I am proud of what we do, um, we've got a number of resources that I would refer people to and happy to, I, I wish I were smart and quick enough to drop it in the chat here if we even have one, but can we go to your website? Are they on your website? You can absolutely go to you can absolutely go to uh, our website ajc.org. You can also search for uh, translate hate. That's going to take you to to uh, our website and a really important document. Uh, you can also uh, it's it's also uh, worth looking at our call to action against anti semitism, which uh, lays out all of the ways that that different parts of society can can really uh, uh, take the lead in fighting anti-Semitism. Uh, and then generally, I think um, our, our other resources can be helpful too, but that Translate Hate, I find, and, and we've now uh, made it available, we make it available as often as we can in as many languages as we can, because it helps people understand that anti-Semitism isn't, it's not new, it is really the oldest hatred. and and that to put it in the context of, of what it means going back through time when Jews were blamed for killing Christ and Jews were blamed for poisoning the wells and the bubonic plague. And, and, and that often led to not just violence, but being expelled from countries. And then that, uh, the worst case, obviously, being the attempted genocide of, of the entire Jewish people and helping to understand that Judaism is more than just a religion that that we're a people and with a history, all of that I think is it goes a long way to help fight back against anti-Semitism just by doing the most important thing we can do, which is really to provide knowledge. Let me offer you an opportunity to, to, to respond to a, a controversial issue. Sure. Uh, earlier this year at the ABA mid-year meeting, 
the ABA House of Delegates passed a resolution condemning anti-Semitic rhetoric. During that debate, um, there was internal discussions around how do you define anti-Semitism? And as you are well aware, there's a definition offered by the International Holocaust Remembrance Association that has caused a great deal of back and forth. Um, yeah. I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to that and offer your perspective on the definition of um, anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I, um, I, it, feels, it feels strange to have to say this, but um, I think we can all agree how important in America uh, free speech is. And, um, and having served as long as I did on the House Judiciary Committee, um, I'm pretty confident saying there aren't a lot of people who are more committed to uh, to the free exchange of ideas and uh, and uh, who would oppose any efforts to limit those uh, exchanges of ideas as I am. So it's it's frustrating to me when people take the IRA definition, which was this definition that created by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance that's been adopted in dozens of countries, um, some who are very supportive of Israel, some who are incredibly critical of Israel at every turn. Uh, and, and it's been adopted in uh, states around the country and counties and, and cities, uh, all to help identify what anti-Semitism is. And it's, the, it's those who suggest that it's some sort of speech code, that it's meant to limit uh, speech, that it's meant to limit criticism of Israel, uh, who I think really are, are misreading it or intentionally trying to uh, convince people that it's something that it isn't. The, the definition, the, the, the IRA definition is really simple. It just talks about a perception of Jews, hatred of Jews, and it talks about both speech and physical attacks directed toward Jews uh, and their property, toward the community, toward religious institutions. That's the definition. Then there are some examples that it gives, and this is where people misread them. Um, most, of the def most of the examples they give, I don't think anyone would be critical of at all. I mean, calling for the, the killing or harming of Jews, I think most people would agree, and if they're not, then I th I'd suggest they're anti-Semites. Um, I'm not making light, but, but killing and calling for the killing of Jews, harming Jews, making dehumanizing and, and demonizing statements about Jews uh, accusing Jews being responsible for wrongdoing committed by a single Jewish person. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are pretty straightforward, but when it gets, when it starts to talk about, and there's some language about, about Nazis, but when it starts to talk about, about Israel, the, the misrepresentation is what's so important here because all the IRA definition does uh, is it says that if you deny the Jewish people the right to self-determination, if you say that the existence of Israel itself is a racist endeavor, the only state in the world that should not exist is the one Jewish state. When no one would make that suggestion about the 57 Muslim states in the world, no one would make that suggestion about other, about any other countries, that, that as, that's an example of anti-Semitism. When you expect behavior of Israel that you don't demand of literally any other democratic country in the world, let alone, let alone non-democratic countries, um, that too is included as an example. There, it's very clear in the definite, and I'll just finish with this one, sorry, but I, I, it's, it's such an important question. Um, it's, it's important to note that it specifically talks about how this is not, this is not a speech code. It's not a legally binding document. These are just examples and that criticism of Israel, even strong criticism of Israel, the kind that you see it around certain parts of the world and frankly within Israel itself, that that just as you would criticize any other country, of course you can criticize Israel. So I appreciate the question because people people are trying to suggest that the IRA definition is something that it isn't. And um, the purpose of it is to help define what anti-Semitism is so that people can spot it. It's not meant to, to codify, it's not meant to impose penalties. Uh, and when it comes to Israel, it's not meant to, to limit speech.
Well, thank you for sharing that perspective. Sure. As a result of that resolution that we adopted back in February, um, our section has um, done continuing programming around this conversation, around the definition of anti-Semitism, the IRA definition. And we have a 21-day challenge that we offer as one programmatic opportunity for our members. And I would invite you and your colleagues at AJC to help us um, in this ongoing conversation. Because uh, uh, I think we're all against anti-Semitism. Um, and I think it's important that we all join together in moving that focus forward. Um, in, in all of its forms. Yeah, I am. I appreciate that. I would be, I'd be uh, honored to play whatever role I can and participate in whatever conversations. Uh, the other, just if I may, Please. look, we we um, AJC advocates for uh, the relationship between the between Israel, the, which is a, a democracy and an ally, and the United States. Um, the other thing that's important to point out in this conversation is. This false, this false narrative that exists, that some, particularly among those who wish to undermine support for Israel, that suggests that somehow being pro-Israel, there's a choice. You can be pro-Israel, or you can you can uh, you, you can be pro-Palestinian. In fact, these two peoples ought to be living side by side, and the the goal obviously is. Two states living side by side in peace and security, and um, and that's as someone who's spent a whole lot of time uh, both in Jerusalem uh, and in Ramallah, uh, talking to leaders in the Israeli community and in the Palestinian community. It's about time that we stop trying to undermine each other's arguments and look for ways to actually find a, a peaceful way forward. And that's I'm happy to happy to express that to, to folks in direct conversation as well. Great, thank you for sharing that. We definitely will um, pick you up on that in the next uh, sure. several months and moving forward. Ted, on a much lighter note, um, when you're not trying to change the world and not running for office, sure. I'd like to ask my guests, what do you do for fun? Um, well, I do love, I love sports. And um, as you may have noticed, it's been a heck of a run for those of us in South Florida where I live. Um, so it's been a great uh, start, starting with uh, Florida Atlantic University, uh, which is just down the road from where I live in the final four, right on through the Panthers and the Stanley Cup finals, the Heat in the NBA finals, the even the Marlins are playing great this year. And I think the Dolphins are going to be the best of all. So I do love sports. That's a fun thing for me to do. Um, I like to, um, I like to read uh, I'm on the plane a lot, so I spend a fair amount of time reading them. That's my next uh, question. What's your, what's oh. what you reading right now? Um, I'm reading a really interesting book uh, called the. It's called the uh, the Measure. It's um, it's a novel. Here's the premise. I don't want to give too much away, but everyone in the world receives a box on the same day, which has a string in it. That the length of the string tells you how much longer your life will continue, how long you're going to live. And the whole book is about what, how we treat each other as a society, the, the implications of knowing how long someone is going to live, how you treat them, what it says about how we treat other groups, even in our own society. Really interesting. And um, the book about, it's called The Measure. The measure. Uh, I can't remember who the author is, but it's, uh, but I, I it's been a fun read, and and I definitely recommend it. And for folks in in um, the the civil rights section in particular, I, I um, it raises some really important issues. I recommend it. I'm going to look that book up. Yeah. And my last question: If you yeah. could wake up tomorrow and you were not a lawyer, what would you want to be and why? Um. I have to. I have to tell you, having spent years um, practicing law in both, both with firms and in house, and then serving in Congress as a lawyer on the Judiciary Committee, um, and now uh, being fortunate to uh, to to run a a nonprofit, an advocacy organization, 
Um, I, I like where I am right now. And if you had asked me this, if you had asked me this question years ago in the middle of my legal practice, I might've said one day it'd be fun to run an organization where every day I can work on the things I'm most passionate about. And here I am. So I feel, I feel pretty lucky. Well, Ted Deutsch, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you for your contribution to our profession, to fighting against racism, anti-Semitism, fighting for social justice and civil rights. You are a true leader. We're proud to know you. To look forward to our continued partnership and collaboration. Thank you. Uh, I, I look forward to it as well. Thanks so much for, for the conversation, Mark. Thank you. Thank you all for being tuning in today. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.